Everybody, uh, I'm not going to say anything about the, the uh, food that was uh, provided at the break in light of our talk this morning. So nobody talk about cookies, nobody talk about soft drinks, and we're all okay. And Joyce has left the building, so we're good. Um, I do want to introduce, uh, you'll see that there's two speakers here this afternoon, and I think that's an important signal that we're sending. And this, the way the university is doing business, and the way, if you choose to come here, the way you will experience your training here is going to change. And so you are nominally going to enroll in the Faculty of Science or the Faculty of Engineering or what have you. You're not going to get strictly the science or the engineering lens applied to the problems that you're dealing with. You are going to get multiple lenses uh, that will focus your attention on a particular problem. And I think you're going to see that in the nature of the final talk today. Now, you're aware of the fact that recent world events have driven home, if we needed it to be driven home again, that the world is running out of fossil fuels. We saw the conflict in, in the Middle East, and we saw the price of fuel go up. And just this morning, uh, the Saudis have agreed to increase production a little bit, and immediately the price of oil dropped by 4 or $5 a barrel. So you see how fragile... Uh, uh, the, re the world's reliance on fossil fuels is. So this afternoon for our final presentation, we have Dr. David Levin from the uh, Department of Biosystems Engineering in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. And it's interesting that a few years ago, the Department of Biosystems Engineering didn't even exist. So that tells you the way university is adapting and changing to the way we look at a particular problem. Was it biology? Was it engineering? Was it agriculture? So they made a new department to bring those multiple lenses. And we have Dr. Richard Sparling from the Department of Microbiology in the Faculty of Science. And just in chatting with Richard beforehand, I'm going to, uh, he'll, he can, he'll have to explain this, I'm going to introduce him as a microbial psychologist, understanding the, uh, the nature of these uh, miniature beasts and, and what they do to us. And, and these uh, two researchers are going to focus essentially on biofuels and alternative fuels in light, of the in light of my earlier comments about the fact that reliance on fossil fuels is, is, uh, can't be sustained. And I think you're going to find this one particularly interesting. And again, think about the fact that this is a, a two-pronged approach, but when you get here, uh, and take whatever course of study you want to take, you're going to have five, six, seven, eight, or literally as many as you want lenses by which to study a particular problem. So please welcome our two speakers this afternoon. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Yep, okay, hi. Um, I'm Dave Levin. Now just a, a quick... Uh, background bio of myself. Actually, I grew up here in Winnipeg. I grew up in the North End. I went to St. John's High School. Um, and I did my first year of university here at the University of Manitoba, and then I went elsewhere to study other things. And I did my undergraduate studies in liberal arts, or sort of a humanities program on environmental studies, trying to come to terms with the problems of sustainability and growth. And this was way back in the 70s or 80s, 70s, yeah. And then I kind of got interested in insects, and I studied entomology. And then through that, I kind of got interested in viruses, so I went to McGill University, and I studied virology, and that was sort of at the beginning of the biotechnology boom back in the 80s. So I've kind of had a very circuitous route um, in my uh, academic career, and I really just followed my heart and really got interested in things and just studied those things because I thought they were really cool and interesting. Anyway, after I, I eventually wound up as a professor at the University of Victoria in BC for 15 years where I studied viruses of insects. Um, and then I moved here in 2006 to set up a new program in biosystems engineering in what we call bioengineering for biofuels and bioproducts. Um, so I'm actually a biologist working with a bunch of engineers. Um, and so this idea of multiple lenses is really important because we, Richard and I, work together uh, as a team. We have a very multidisciplinary approach. And he's a microbiologist. I'm originally a virologist, but I'm kind of a wannabe engineer. And, uh, um, and we have students working in our group who are trained in, in microbiology, biochemistry, analytical chemistry, molecular biology, bioinformatics, uh, and bioprocess engineering, and mechanical engineering. And they're all working together on the same problems, bringing different perspectives of those problems together into sort of one program. And, uh, and so I think we have a very unique program, and we're going to tell you a little bit about it. But before we get into the, the exciting stuff, we're going to talk about the depressing stuff. So as you know, and I'm sure all of you are very aware, um, 
we are, as a species, are facing one of the biggest challenges uh, in our evolutionary history, essentially. We have a global population that, is ex that will reach 9 billion people by the middle of this century. And about 6 billion of those people will live in urban centers, uh, not in, in the countryside, essentially. Um, and, of course, if you're living in an urban center, you need to be able to, draw, to get transportation to go from one place to another to work. You need to, if you live in a cold climate like we do, you need to have fuel to heat your home and power uh, when your day is only, uh, you know, it's eight hours or you know, six hours long in the winter. You have to have light. So we need fuels to, for transportation and heat and power. And uh, based on our fossil fuel supply, basically we have 218 years of coal and 41 years of oil and 63 years of natural gas at, uh, when our population reaches 9 billion people, right? Um, <clears throat> converging with that, and, and perhaps as a consequence of that, we have the, the, cli the climate change issue, right? So greenhouse gas, uh, carbon dioxide from the combustion of fossil fuels, methane from landfills um, are gases that go into the atmosphere and they trap heat from the sun in the greenhouse effect and it's leading to uh, changes in climate. Uh, you know, we, people call it global warming, but it's not really necessarily global warming. There are, it's basically massive change in the in redistribution of the climate, the energy in the climate, which results in extreme weather, right? So we've all seen examples of extreme weather, extreme, you know, more hurricanes in the hurricane season in the, from the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico. Uh, torrential rains around the world, in New, uh, Australia that's been having a drought for the last 15 years is suddenly inundated with, with a deluge of water and, and the city of Brisbane essentially was uh, you know, submerged in water. Um, so we're seeing these kinds of global changes in climate and they will continue to change as the, as the carbon and, and, uh, you know, in, in the atmosphere increases. I mean, we're, we're at about, uh, I think, 270 parts per million now. Um, the projection is, is 540 to 970 parts per million by, uh, uh, by the middle of the century or the end of this century, uh, which will lead to anywhere from a two to five degree change in climate. And if you can see from these, these uh, maps here, this could lead, this is just a scenario, we don't really know for sure, but this is a, a projection that all of the yellow areas are areas that are, are desert, no, can no longer support agriculture, and without agriculture, there's no food, and if you have 9 billion people to feed, how are you going to do that? So, so we have a, some major challenges that we have to meet. Um, transportation is one of our major energy consumers, or sources of, of energy consumption in our society, and it's the largest contribution to greenhouse gas emissions uh, worldwide. And layered on top of that is the the growth of developing countries' uh, economies. So China and India, which between the two of them have almost half the world's population, their, popula their industries are expanding, their consumption of fossil fuels is expanding, and so that creates greater demand for, for energy globally. So global energy demand is expected to increase by 52% by 2025, which is not very far away, right? Um, it's only another, well, 12, 13 years, right? So, so things are changing. Now, um, when we talk about biofuels as, as an alternative, Richard and I are working on the idea of, you know, can we make biofuels from biomass, from agricultural uh, or forestry? And, um, and so the difference between biofuels and fossil fuels is that fossil fuels basically are derived from plants that lived 300 to 500 million years ago that captured sunlight and fixed it into carbon and then died and then were buried under layers of sediment and compressed and they eventually turn into what we call petroleum or oil today. Um, it's non-renewable because the process of making that is so long, 300 million years, that we can't reproduce it in our lifetime, right? So, and biofuels, on the other hand, are laid from, made from recently living uh, plant materials that, that we can grow on a continuous basis and we derive uh, sources of energy and fuel, uh, fuels and, and products from them in current time. So, so if you have a petrochemistry, you, you fix sunlight with photosynthesis into biomass that dies, it, 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 it's uh, compressed 
over millions of tens of tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years into fuels and then we refine it and combust it and we generate CO2 and it's pretty well gone. So um, with, bio, with the biotech industry, a biotech approach, uh, biofuels, we take sunlight, uh, sunlight is captured by plants into biomass over a span of say one to 10 years or even 20 years necessary, it's converted into carbohydrates uh, and then those carbohydrates can be converted by microbial processes into fuel which then gets combusted or into products like biodegradable plastics. And it's recyclable because the carbon that's released is consumed, again, it, it's, it, you, you capture the carbon in plant material, you release it through combustion, it goes into the atmosphere again, but it's in a lifespan of, that is current over you know, the decades or so or the hundreds of years or so that we are living now. It's, we're not, the problem is, so, so this is considered kind of carbon neutral because you're really con taking carbon in the atmosphere, fixing it into plants and releasing it again in, in, in current time as opposed to taking carbon that was fixed millions or hundreds of millions of years ago and releasing it into the atmosphere. The carbon cycle, the carbon that's con released into the atmosphere when you drive your car stays in the atmosphere anywhere from 300 to 500 years. Some people even say even longer, up to 1,000 years. So it takes that long for the carbon that's released into the atmosphere to get recycled back into plants. And we've been taking carbon that was sequestered or hidden away for 300 million years and we're releasing it into the atmosphere in a very short period of time. And that's why we're getting this accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere leading to climate change. Now, biofuels are, are really a good alternative to fossil fuels because it can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. It, being realistic, it cannot replace fossil fuels, but it can displace a large portion of the fossil fuels that we use if it's done correctly or wisely. Okay? Current biofuels that, we, that, are, that are available today are uh, ethanol and, and diesel. So the focus in North America has largely been bioethanol. The focus in Europe is primarily biodiesel. Uh, and there are different drivers in different parts of the world for, for producing these biofuels. So in the US, it's primarily energy security. Uh, they don't want to buy oil from uh, countries that are unfavorable to, to American politics, uh, like the Middle East. Um, in Canada, the driver is climate change and rural development, the real development of real com rural communities. If you, if you can stimulate rural economies, then people will stay on the farm or stay in the country rather than move to the cities, and that's probably a good thing for, uh, for the country and the economy. Um, now, we talk, when we talk about biofuels, they're divided into what we call first generation and second generation and then next generation, essentially. And first generation biofuels oops, are derived uh, from uh, feedstocks that are primarily produced for food. So bioethanol is made from corn uh, in the States. In Western Canada, it's made primarily from wheat. In Brazil, it's made from sugarcane. Um, and basically, the, what's essential is that all of these materials, the corn, the wheat, the sugar cane, are a source of sugars. Now, corn and wheat are seeds, but the seed is made up of starch, and starch is a long polymer, a long chain of sugar molecules. So it's easy to, re to release those sugars and produce bioethanol. Um, biodiesel is made up from, from, from oils, from plants, or from animal fats. Um, and these are mature technologies and are presently, you know, being used to produce these biofuels in, around the world. So, and this is what's going into your cars today. If you, can, if you, want, if you go to Husky or uh, Husky Energy gas station, all of the gas that you buy there has at least 10% ethanol blended. And many other, uh, 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 I think Shell and also Petro-Canada also sell 10% blended ethanol gasoline. Biodiesel is a bit harder to buy at this time. I'm, uh, I don't think there's any commercial biodiesel store, uh, pumps here in Manitoba at this point. Anyway, so there's different pathways to making ethanol. You can use starch base, which like I said, corn or, or wheat, sugar base, like from sugar cane. Um, and then there's cellulose. Now cellulose is the stuff that makes up wood. All of, uh, sort of it's the structural support of plant material and it's made up of a complex of, of three different kinds of molecules, uh, which I'll talk about in a, in, a mo uh, in a moment. Anyway, so we have first generation fuels. The, the downside of first generation biofuels is that, like bioethanol, is that 
people say that it's carbon neutral. Well, there's some debate about whether it's really carbon neutral because you have, a, especially in the states where you're using intensive corn production to make the fuel, there's a lot of fossil fuels that are burned or con consumed in order to grow that corn and harvest it. So there's some people who say that, that if you changed all of the land or a large portion of land that's dedicated to food to make fuel, then you're going to actually increase the amount of greenhouse gases that you can produce over the next 30 years. And, that, and the food versus fuel issue is, is sort of important as well. Um, in the States in the 2006 or 7, they, they, they maybe 10 to 15 percent of the corn crop was dedicated, uh, diverted from food to fuel. Uh, in this last year, 2008, uh, 2010, 2009, 2010 growing season, about 35 percent of the corn harvest was diverted into from food to fuel. Now, you have to keep in mind that uh, nobody, the corn that's grown is usually the corn that goes to feed cows, right? Anybody, anybody from a farm here? Anybody know that, right? You don't eat the cow corn, right? It's very hard, um, and uh, you know, we like the soft uh, sweet corn, which is great, but that's not the stuff that goes into the biofuels. 90% of the corn that's grown in North America is used to pro in, in processed food. So it's all the, if you look at any food product on the grocery shelf, you'll see corn starch or modified corn components is, as a major comp constituent of those things. The cereals, uh, all kinds of foods anyway. I can't even list them off the top of my head. But 90% of the food of the corn goes into processed foods or into animal feed. And so, uh, and very little of that corn is actually exported for human consumption in other parts of the world. So when people say, well, food, uh, biofuels are taking food away from people in developing countries is not really true because most of it goes into processed food and really results in an increase in the price of your cereal box as opposed to causing starvation in, in Africa. Um, anyway, the problem is that really even if you had all, converted all of the land around the world into, into producing corn for biofuels, you wouldn't have enough biofuel to stop using gasoline. You don't need Perhaps it's sort of there's seven crops around the world, wheat, corn, sorghum, sugarcane, cassava, that account for 42% of the cropland. And if you took all of that land and made it into biofuel producing uh, land, then only half of the global gasoline consumption would be satisfied. So clearly from first generation, uh, first generation bioethanol, you can't get enough of it to, to displace completely the fossil fuel consumption. So that leads to other sources of sugars for making biofuels. And so that would be like uh, what we call second generation bioethanol made from cellulosic material. And that could be uh, hemp or switchgrass or perennial, perennial grasses, large uh, crops that have a lot of fiber in them. Uh, could be logging waste or forestry waste, or it could be simply all of the coffee cups that you're drinking from. Um, and, you know, there's a, a Tim Hortons sells a billion cups of coffee in Canada, and in, the, in Canada and the U.S., there's about 30 billion coffee cups sold uh, by Starbucks and other companies, and that amounts to a huge amount of material that could be uh, converted easily into fuel. So we have to rethink about uh, things that we consider waste could act are actually a resource that can be used in a very positive way to uh, reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. Anyway, the thing about cellulose is that it's um, a very complex structure. It's a very highly ordered uh, molecule, a set of molecules, three different molecules that are kind of wound into cables like, like uh, suspension bridges. Um, they're very uh, hard to break down. And, um, and so you, if, in order to get the sugars out of it, you have to disrupt the structure of this, and, and it takes a lot of energy and a lot of processing to, to get the sugars that you convert into ethanol. And, uh, and so there are a lot of people working on this problem of how to do that efficiently. Now, as, you, uh, as uh, Dr. Lavin uh, pointed out, the price of gas is already going up. Uh, the, global, the crisis in the Middle East has uh, the, risen, the forced the barrel of oil up to over $100, uh, about $100 a barrel now. Um, this is not new. Back in the day, in the 70s, there was the, f the 70s and early 80s, the first oil crisis essentially caused a huge increase in gas prices or price of oil resulting in an increase in gas prices and people uh, couldn't drive their cars because there was a gas shortage at pumps and, and that had a big impact on the economy. That, in that, that time, people started thinking about 
alternative energies. And so all of the, the kind of the technologies that we see today in biofuels really started back in the 70s and early 80s with, as a consequence of the of first, what we call the first oil crisis. So, so, uh, so why didn't we switch over to biofuels 20 years ago? Well, after that crisis, the price of oil went down again and nobody cared about have developing biofuels anymore because oil was cheap again. So they continued to buy it. It was business as usual. Um, so also at that time, we didn't have the technologies that we have today. So there's been a, a huge um, movement or a huge development of new technologies that will allow us to do a lot more interesting things with microorganisms than we could uh, back in the 70s uh, and early 80s. So uh, amongst these are, say, D genomes, D DNA sequencing. But when I was a grad student in the early 80s, we used to sequence DNA by chemical cleavage. So it's a, a very complex process where you had different kinds of chemicals mixed together, and you could sequence maybe a couple hundred base pairs of DNA um, in, uh, and it took months to years to sequence anything long uh, of any length. Uh, shortly after that, in the mid-80s, uh, a guy named um, Sanger developed uh, a, an enzymatic-based process called the uh, chain terminating sequence, and you could sequence several hundred base pairs at a time, and it maybe you took months to, uh, a couple of months to, to sequence one gene. Well, today, we can sequence entire genomes millions of base pairs in a day. Uh, the project that we're working on, our back, the bacteria we're looking at, have genomes of about four million, four to five million base pairs. We, had this, we get that sequenced in, in a day. Five, four to five million base pairs sequenced in a day. We get the, da the data from all of that in, in about a week, and then it takes some months for us to analyze that data and figure out what's going on. So there's a huge step forward. And understanding the relationship between the genes that are in a genome and the, and the enzyme processes and the metabolic pathways that are used leading to the synthesis of various products like ethanol or, or biodiesel or hydrogen, things that could be used as fuels, is really the basis of what we do. And Richard, Dr. Sparling will talk about that starting now. Uh, that's me making wine. Uh, Part of the issue we've had, I'll put this down here for a second. Sure, to, I can be your, your model yes, when you're ready. Yes. Uh, part of the, so part of the issue, and it links to the fact that I'm a microbial psychologist, is that when you're trying to make wine, hey, that's ethanol too, uh, or beer, that's ethanol too, or whiskey, that's almost husky. Uh, we can look at it as a black box. You know, come on. Come on. Do something. Nice. Okay, miracle happens. Voila. We have bacteria that can degrade wheat straw, that can degrade Tim Hortons cups or Starbucks cups. We're not that particular. <laughs> but it's one thing to say we've got bacteria that can do it. It's another thing to say we have bacteria that can do it efficiently when we want it, the way we want it. And this is where the new technologies come in and this is where the microbial psychologist comes in. How are you today? How are your genes? Are they being well expressed? Oh, you have a problem with your alcohol dehydrogenase, it just doesn't have enough oomph? Well, maybe we can fix that. Uh, a little step here, a little step there, maybe change the gene. Voila, new improved. Oh, and you're also slow at degrading cellulose. Well, let's see what we can do with that. So, back in the day, we knew how, we knew how to make whiskey, and actually the first husky plant, if I recall, had purchased old whiskey stills. And that's how our first biofuels came to being in Manitoba. So we're looking at different new organisms. And we go fishing all over the world. I've got friends swimming in compost piles. I've got friends going to New Zealand, into the deep sea, into the uh, nice warm ponds they have there. 
and looking for new bacteria. Looking for bacteria that are better, more performant, happier, more psychologically, I mean enzymatically fit, than the ones that we have today. So these are samples of a colleague of ours in New Zealand at GNS Science who fishes in the hot springs for new bacteria. And I have a graduate student actually leaving tomorrow for New Zealand, the North Island, so don't worry. Uh, he won't hit a earthquake, but there's volcanic activity instead. Uh, remember, you can't win. This is science. Uh, so we can go out and look, hopefully, for new organisms. And this is me looking for new organisms as well. This is a pile of wood chips that's actually smoldering. The, the inside of that wood chip pile is actually around 67 degrees Celsius. And so I've also gone into this wood chip pile to look for bacteria. So we start the process by fishing expeditions in either exotic or less than exotic places. And from there, we want to see what the bacteria are like. And one of the bacteria that we've been mainly focusing our attention on these days are two organisms of the genus Clostridium. One is Clostridium termitidus, and the other one is Clostridium thermocellum. Uh, what's important here is that one likes it hot and one likes it tepid. So you've got a bug growing at 60 degrees, bug growing at 37 degrees. And they can degrade cellulose, or, whoops, back, back, back. Uh, okay. They can degrade cellulose as Tim Hortons cups. They can degrade cellulose as delignified wood. They can degrade cellulose as straw. And as you saw or can see at the end, if you come up, you will find that we can turn pieces of paper into real mush. And the mush contains ethanol. And actually, some of the gas bubbles are hydrogen. So we have actually the, the organisms that can do two different biofuels, ethanol or hydrogen. We can now ask the question, can we tweak them in one way or another? Now, an interesting thing about these bugs is that they seem to be kind of rough around the edges. And that is because they have a cellulosome. The interesting thing about the bugs we're working with is they literally come with Swiss Army knives. They come fully prepared to eat wood. They're better than beavers. Beavers only have two teeth. These guys have cellulases, xylanases, uh, glucosidases, and a whole bunch of other little ases at their disposal, and they just go <coughs> at the wood. And so this is what they look like. And if I recall, this is what they look like directly on wood fibers. And you can see them actually sinking their teeth and sinking themselves into the wood as they dissolve the wood away and turn it into some of the finest alcohol I've had. No. Uh, <laughs> actually, we could try making whiskey, too. We could. You know, could we have U of M whiskey? No. <laughs> anyway, I've got a still in the back. No. Uh, one of the problems we have with these bugs is while they do die a happy death uh, with ethanol, they actually are teetotalers. They produce ethanol, but the ethanol is toxic. Oh, right, you're uh, adolescents, right. Ethanol is toxic. Bacteria die. Yeah. <laughs> That's a better tune, right? <laughs> okay, so... Uh, so one of the things we're going to want to do is raise the level of ethanol that they can produce for the same amount of, uh, of cellulose. And that's part of the alchemy of what we're trying to do. Alchemy is bringing different things together to try to take some waste and turn it into something valuable. And that's why we had the catchy title. And so here's part of our alchemy here. We take these waste products, and as you can see here, you can pulverize whatever cup you want. You can even use paper plates. Uh, generic paper cups also work. They don't have to have a brand name on it. And we have 
uh, and we can degrade it and produce the alcohol. And as Dr. Levin said, 130 billion cups per year in the United States. That's a lot of waste. So, today we can make biofuels from cellulose. We have some right there. The problem is the yields are low, the speeds are slow, and at the price of oil right now, we still can't quite compete with petrochemicals. Give us a couple days, the price of oil might go up again. We'll talk another story. But the idea that we have is to try to understand these organisms. And, you know, you can talk to them all you want, they don't respond. So you can ask, well, tell me more about yourself. Well, each one of these bacteria has written a book. It's around 4,000 letters long, 4, 4 million letters long. It's their genome. And as Dr. Levin mentioned, we now have technologies that allow us to read these books, these instruction books, how to make Clostridium thermocellum, for example, very quickly. The process these days is called pyrosequencing. There are other sequencing methods online being developed uh, that could probably sequence even faster. The problem with that is that their output looks like this. Can anyone read this? A, A, T, G, A, G, T, T, A, T, T, C, A, G, G, A. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> well, there's the information on how to make every single enzyme is in there. Well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is only the first 3,000, yes, I counted them, basis of a 3,800,000 uh, base genome. So we can go manually and look for the next start site, transfer all of this information from DNA to amino acids, compare that amino acid sequence to other amino acid sequences and say, ah, oh, I know you, you're an alcohol dehydrogenase, or hi, I know you, you're a pep carboxykinase, or I have a clue what you are. So right now, one of the exciting fields in the biosciences is actually taking computer science and molecular biology and putting it together because it's the computing power that will allow us to interpret this. I don't want to read this any more than you do. So we let the computers do it. And so here is just an example of part of a sequence from the uh, genome of Clostridium thermocellum C T T G G T T G A C A G blah 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 blah. So uh, the computer can read this and say, okay, there's a stop site here, and a little bit later on, here's another start site for another amino for another protein, and then go about and say, well, this is probably a uh, malic enzyme. This is probably a malate dehydrogenase. There's a bunch on this other strand. There's an alcohol, there's a hydrogenase, and then there's a ferredoxin, and it can read on. So as the computer can tell us what are the genes available to the cell, basically what are the enzymes, the, potentially the enzymes it has, we can then turn around and look at what are the potential pathways the organism has to make its end products. And so, on the basis of the information, we can say that Clostridium thermocellum, as an example, can take cellulose, convert it to cellobios, take it in, make pyruvate, and has a potential of producing lactate, formate, ethanol, acetate, and hydrogen. So it can potentially do this, but we need to figure out when it does what, 
so that we can concentrate either on ethanol production or hydrogen production. So it's basically the psychology part. So how are you feeling today? Uh, can I get you to produce a little bit more ethanol? I'm sure it'll make you feel better. And so we go a step further in our understanding by going from the bioinformatics or the, of the genome to asking what proteins are actually produced. So we're developing a set of tools and understandings of these bacteria so that we can know when they're producing ethanol, what are the genes that are on, what are the genes that are off. When they're producing hydrogen, mainly, what are the genes that are on, what are the genes that are off. And doing this with several different organisms, and there's already, it's already been done not just in our labs, but in several other labs, we can now look at different organisms and compare them. Oh, all of the good hydrogen producers have these genes. Oh, how interesting. All of the good ethanol producers have these genes. And then we can take that and merge that with the producers, for example, of good cellulose degradation and say, you know what, Clostridium thermocellum? I think you should get rid of this protein this way. I think this gene has got to go. And so through molecular biology, we can now tailor make, design organisms that are more performant, that are better suited to the industrial processes we want them to do. Now, this is all the bug. The bug is going to be put in the context. The context is going to be a fermentation system. Obviously, it's going to be a big fermentation system, but right now, we can in our labs take the bacteria that we're growing, the bacteria that we're trying to understand, the bacteria whose genomes we know, and put them through their paces in a scenario that's at least a scaled down model of the big industrial process. And ask them, are you still feeling well? Is going around in circles in a fermenter being agitated hindering your performance? And this is where the microbiology now merges into the uh, engineering. That I can pass now the torch. Hey, I've got a good bug. It does a good job. As a microbiologist, I'm a molecular biologist, I can pass it on to the engineer and say, now, can you give it a nice home so that it can produce for us the amounts of ethanol or the amounts of anything that we need? Now, we're probably giving you a bit of a wrong impression when we're putting so much focus right now on biofuels. Biofuels is in everybody's mind as something that can replace petroleum. But if you think about it, petroleum isn't just gasoline, diesel, jet fuel. It's all your plastic bags. It's the liner in the Tim Hortons cup. It's flower pots. We use plastics all the time. And so what we're saying as well is that producing one product isn't good enough to be sustainable. That if you're going to have a raw product, even a waste, you shouldn't be just making one thing out of it. And so the concept of a biorefinery is not just I'm going to produce one thing, but I'm going to take one substrate or several and then see how many different products I can make from it. So that when the price of oil goes down again, I can do something else with it. So I'm not dependent on just one market. And I'd like to show you another thing that we can do for, with cellulosic waste. Actually, it's colleagues of ours in New Zealand that are doing this uh, as an example. Uh, we have uh, one other thing that you can do with cellulosic waste is feed it to bacteria that make plastic. And uh, the group at uh, Scion in New Zealand 
is basically taking wastewater, feeding it to bacteria, and the bacteria produce naturally as a storage material bioplastic. Polyhydroxyalkanoids. They're basically a polyester. And because they make it as a storage molecule, they also make the enzyme to degrade it. So there are other things besides fuels that we can make from cellulose. And the example I'm showing you here is this plastic. And this plastic over time will degrade back. So if you're as stingy as me and wants to keep my plastic pot forever, I'm out of luck. But if you're one of those who buys these little plastic containers, uh, you know, flower pots, for example, and you just throw them away, they will degrade in the Brady landfill site. Or maybe those of you who drink out of these uh, plastic bottles of water or things like that, that maybe one day we'll get them to degrade as well. So the, the end game, the the really milking of waste materials, turning it into as much gold as possible, is to take biomass and treat it in such a way that its fermentation products will provide prod end products that are useful. Not just fuels, but plastics and other valued products. But that's not all we can do. We can also combine the biorefinery with the traditional oil refinery as well and move biomass from the biorefinery to the old-fashioned processes of oil refining in order to produce other carbon-containing materials, other fuels, gasoline, etc. So the vision of the future, I think, is that we have a lot of organic waste. Much of it we can't recycle. Some of it we recycle. Some of it is too costly to recycle. Instead of just throwing it away, we can recycle it into new products. And I think I've irritated your ear long enough. Okay, the first question uh, was the timeline. Of course, that all depends on the price of oil, right? If the price of oil drops back down to $70, then all bets are off, and all of the alternatives basically go back on the shelf. If oil goes up to $150 a barrel, then there will be more investment in this kind of research and development, and the timeline becomes much shorter because it becomes critical that we get alternatives. The work that we're doing, um, I. We would, we're sort of anticipating moving to a pilot scale in, within three to five years. So that, that's sort of the timeline at the current, kind of current level of investment. If we, if we get more investment, more money that providing uh, money for graduate students and equipment, facilities, and things, we, think we can go faster. So, uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is about uh, uh, oil or CO2 basically re recycling into fuels, right? The thing is that there's a lot of interest um, in the idea of using algae to capture CO2 with sunlight to make biomass, and, and a lot of algae produce oils that can be turned into that can be turned into biodiesel, for example. So, a lot of effort around the world doing this kind of thing. Problem is, you cannot grow algae in large quantities in Manitoba in the winter, right? Uh, even in Minnesota, or uh, you can't grow it in a cold climate. So. Countries, uh, where if you're going to do massive production, you have to have very, very large ponds, 
out in the desert someplace, so in Israel, in, in, South, in Australia, uh, even in, you know, in warmer climates, they're doing these things. But there are lots of problems with it. And also the problem is that algae grow very, very slowly, and they require certain conditions in order to maximize the production of the oils for things. So I am not, I'm not a big fan of, of algae-based fuels because I just don't think that they can do it. Um, we actually have a project. I have a graduate student sitting right here, Ryan, uh, who's actually an expert in algae biology. He worked for the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado uh, on algae and biofuels, and then he came to work as a grad student. He's working on yeast that produce oils in the same way that algae do, but yeast grow much faster to much higher densities. And, uh, you know, we're talking uh, days, uh, a day or a sort of overnight growth of, of a yeast compared to 16 to 20 days or even a month or more for the algae. So I think, uh, I think the jury's still out on algal-based biofuels. I mean, it can be done, but can it be done at the scale, the industrial scale, to make any impact? I doubt it. Please join me in thanking our last speakers in the day. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, just the $30,000? Yes. That's, 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 it's written by Janine. So oh, okay, know. great. Thank you. So I'd like to thank you all for coming today, and I just want to make one remark. I think what you saw today was a small sampling of the kind of work that goes on at this university, cross-cutting from everything from neuroscience to biofuels to dietary to computer science to physics, you name it. What you will get when you come to the University of Manitoba, should you choose to come here, is the opportunity to, to be exposed to those kinds of areas and many, many, many more. And the way I look at it is what you get when you come here is you get a whole series of doors. I, I can't even count the number of doors through which you can go. And you can combine a bit of this and a bit of this and a bit of this. And you saw a prime example of that in our last speakers. You don't, because you're in the faculty of agriculture, doesn't mean you just do animal science or plant science. You can cross boundaries, you can combine, and essentially carve out which series of those doors you decide to walk through. When I look out at this audience, I look at the future, because you are our future. And what our part of our job is, is to train our replacements. And I can think I can speak for all of us up here and all of the speakers today, that we want our replacements to be better than we are. And that's your job, and that's your future out at this university. So please take the message to your colleagues. Don't forget to fill out your evaluation forms, and don't forget the essay contest. Uh, the prize is $250, uh, I mean $250 uh, which is a nice chunk of change. And enjoy the weekend and drive safe. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here.